visitors in the room, we invite you to take a seat, please, if you would. You don't have to, but we prefer it. Uh, there are sign-up sheets at the front desk up here on the side. There are three by five cards. If you would like to jot out a question, we'll try to ask it if we can. And uh, there are voters' guides for the League of Women's Voters, Central New Mexico, on the table also. Excuse me, who's who's the political director? We'll talk about voters' guides in a minute. So, no? Good evening. I'm Bill Holker. I'm the president of the District 7 Coalition of Neighborhoods. And we are very happy and welcome to see you all here tonight. We really appreciate it. We also appreciate the candidates being here. We do have uh, a couple other elected officials I'd like to recognize over here. State Rep. Christina Trujillo is here. And if you'd like to Tonight's forum is organized and sponsored by the District 7 Coalition of Neighborhood Associations in conjunction with the League of Women Voters of Central New Mexico. Uh, my name is Steve Wentworth. I'm going to be moderating the forum tonight, representing the League of Women Voters. Our timekeeper is Cheryl Haker, right here. Karen Wentworth, right there. And Ann Harris will be reviewing questions. <coughs> Uh, from the audience. We have cards at the table. If you haven't picked one up yet, please card will write legibly so we can read it or we won't ask it. And uh, they'll review the question. Make sure your questions are appropriate for all of the candidates. We're not going to accept questions that are targeted questions or pointed questions at specific candidates. Uh, real quick, I'm going to talk about the League of Women Voters. It's a nonpartisan political organization open to citizens over the age of 18, that includes both men and women. The League encourages an informed and active participation in government and seeks to influence public policy through education and advocacy. We do not support nor do we oppose political candidates or parties. We frequently moderate these types of forums. If we're a nonpartisan type of thing, we publish the who's who of political directory. This is a great little tool if you do neighborhood work, advocacy work. It lists everybody you need to contact about issues. Got their email address, got uh, where to contact them, and so on and so forth. It is a fabulous tool. Uh, we also publish the voters' guide for each uh, political race, general and municipal election. Copies of this year's guide will be available at senior centers, community centers, public libraries, and businesses throughout the Albuquerque area in the next couple of weeks. It will also be posted on the League of Women Voters of Central New Mexico's website. And that is www.lwbcnm.org. League of Women Voters Central New Mexico.org. And uh, we would encourage people to join the League. We need uh, folks who are concerned about what's going on in government and uh, uh, it's a great organization with a lot of dedicated people. I want to thank the District 7 Coalition of Neighborhood Associations for arranging this. Lori Jameson and Bill Bowen.
and I'm mom to two terrific young adults. I have been a small business owner and contractor to Sandia National Lab, and I have served for four terms in the New Mexico State Legislature where I worked on public policy, election law, tax law, and taking care of our state, including emergency preparedness. You know, District 7 is absolutely unique. We are just bursting at the seams in terms of new growth, new opportunities in the uptown sector. I am so excited to work on this. But at the same time, we have big issues to address. We are going to have to talk about traffic, zoning, sector plans, and, and how we get around easily in the state, in, in, in the uptown area. But at the end of the day, the most important job of a city councilor is constituent services. And I am just thrilled when I get a call from any one of you, whether it's about a dead tree, the medians, making sure that our parks are maintained. That is the best part about being a city councilor, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Ms. Diane Gibson. Thank you. Um, I would like to also thank uh, the League of Women Voters for moderating tonight, as well as Coalition 7 in particular for organizing this and giving us all three of us a chance to speak to you. My name is Diane Gibson, and I am the candidate for City Council in District 7. Um, I've been in New Mexico since 1975. I've lived in the Albuquerque area since 1979. And in the past several months, I have been talking with people at their doorstep, at their places of businesses, talked with business owners and people throughout this district. Uh, and many of them who are here today, I recognize you. Um, and this has been a pleasure. It's been a wonderful experience for me. I am running for city council out of a genuine concern for our lagging economy, uh, poor job growth, uh, out of concern for public safety uh, agencies and our schools. My name is Diane Gibson and I hope to instill a little bit of trust in me tonight and eventually earn your vote on October 8th. Thank you very much. Our first question, if you've been following the news, there's uh, been a lot of ballots going out and about. Many believe it is wrong for the city to take on the issue of women's reproductive rights, and many believe it is a state issue, and the city attorney has stated the issue would probably be thrown out of court. Should the city council take up the issue of late term abortion? The council goes. <laughs>
Should Albuquerque be governed by elected officials or by small groups able to gather enough signatures for these petitions? This happened last year a couple of times with uh, voters approving an increase to the city's minimum wage and an increase to the percentage of votes required to avoid a runoff election. Now we have the abortion issue. As stated, the cost of these elections is about $600,000 for a special election. Is this good government? Should the city charter be changed that allows such elections by petition? Ms. Gibson. First of all, I have to fix what Let's I just give said. A minute and a half, please. Okay, thank you. I am not pro-life. I don't know what I can do. I am rabidly pro-choice. Very sorry about that. That's one of those oops moments. Um, but in answer to your question, I very much support the ballot initiative. I think that it's important for uh, citizens who are registered to vote to be able to sign a petition and make their, uh, their feelings known on any particular topic. Um, so, now that aside, I also am concerned about having too many special elections because that does get very costly for uh, the, the, uh, the city. So, um, I think that an alternative that we can look at, investigate, and, and possibly enact would be um, like making those decisions that uh, pass the uh, petition test go to the next city election. Mr. Biggs. The difference between the minimum wage and the abortion issue is that, is that there's no federal precedent against a minimum wage. Um, and so I think that would be the difference Generally speaking, I think special elections are a good thing. I think they're, they should be in place if the city council is not doing what it's supposed to do. That, that minimum wage was passed with an overwhelming majority in Albuquerque. And that just goes to show that the city council was probably out of touch um, with where the minimum wage was, where our labor was, and, and how well people are being uh, uh, compensated for the work that they're doing. So in many cases, yeah, I think we need to have those special elections to just make sure that the voters do have an outlet if, if city council is not adequately representing them. Um, and, and so occasionally I would support a special election. Again, they're very expensive, and I think it needs to be extremely important issues that get taken to those, uh, not, not frivolous issues that will be thrown out regardless of, of what passes or not. I'm not a big fan. I was not a big fan of voter initiative in California with Prop 13. And I'm not a big fan here, not because I don't want individuals or groups who feel like their elected did not serve them to have a voice, but there is a problem. And the problem, not only with minimum wage, but also the unborn pain capable ordinance is the same, in that the language used to write these initiatives has not gone structure is almost unenforceable, and in some cases absolutely unenforceable and unconstitutional. Now there are several ways that we could approach this, and one is to make a change to the charter that says any voter initiatives uh, that are presented must first go through the council service for appropriate constructs. If you, if, because can you imagine taking all of the voters who, were, who voted for the minimum wage and having them be told, oh, well, this doesn't count. And that's literally what is happening. So words matter. And so I look at both of these issues. In the case of the unformed pain capable ordinance that is before us, how interesting it is that it is almost a restatement of Roe v. Wade for our city because our city is one of the few that does late term abortions. But at the same time, the way it was written is problematic. Candidates mentioned the minimum wage. Now, the voters overwhelmingly approved the increase in the minimum wage. The city attorney really doesn't enforce this law. Should the city enforce the law to make it a violation uh, as a misdemeanor or a more serious charge as it is currently done in Santa Fe? Ms. 
Santa Fe has passed laws and they reinforce it. Should the city do the same thing? Mr. Biggs. Uh, absolutely, I think the city should enforce it. I, I'm, I'm a small business owner and all my employees get paid vastly more than, uh, than the minimum wage. Um, the 850 increase wasn't a huge amount, um, or 825, uh, was not a large, it was not a large uh, increase. Um, it, it's a very basic wage that allows people to put food on their table, to buy their children presents at Christmas time. It's it's absolutely necessary that we have that on the books, and it's also necessarily necessary that the city actually enforce it, and that it is punishable, and it should not be put on people making the minimum wage to go hire a private attorney, which is what the city council has told these individuals with complaints to do. It should not be put on them. They're making minimum wage. What makes you think that they can afford an attorney? Thank you. Those are all jokes. I go back to my previous statement. How you write these initiatives is absolutely critical. And I think that when we are putting initiatives on the ballot, they should be enforceable. And if they're not, what are we doing? And so with the minimum wage in particular, uh, there are entire sections that are not enforceable. So if we're going to have a law, let's make sure that we enforce it. Um, and I, I agree with Matt that, in fact, 850 an hour is probably not as big a deal as you think until you get to the restaurant industry. And for the restaurant industry, it is probably now a decrease in salary for the back room, the, the line cooks, because the folks up in the front always got an increase when prices went up kind of an interesting concept that there is this problem. Um, and, and so, again, when we have a law, no matter what you do, the first thing that I ask, is this enforceable? And if it's not, then we need to go back to the council service. We need to start again. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gibson. Well, I guess we're three for three. I also believe that any law that is passed should be enforceable. There, there is heat in the minimum wage law, and we need to use this um, for people who choose to not abide by that law. They should <coughs> be held responsible for it. Um, and uh, and if, if that means, and now I have heard some talk about having a, a special budget item for enforcement of that law. I don't think that that's necessary. I don't want to even start on down that road. That's a slippery slope. We cannot budget for enforcement of every law that we pass. But for those companies that choose to stay in business and do not um, honor our city laws, then they should pay the price for it. Thank you. This next question will be for Ms. Earl Jones. In light of the facts that the U.S. Justice Department is investigating our police department, what are your thoughts concerning how the Police Oversight Commission is set up? I do understand that recent changes were made to the Police Oversight Commission. What changes would you make to that, and how would you make this thing function better, in your opinion? Uh, clearly, there are problems with the Police Oversight Commission as it was structured. Some of that was personality, but some of it was structure. You know, if you're going to look at a police department, you have to have enough expertise to, to actually evaluate the job that they are doing. But you also, if you're going to take the time to make that evaluation, one of the weaknesses of the current um, Police Oversight Commission is it didn't go anywhere. If there is no connection to the police chief in terms of any type of, of discipline, then it really doesn't matter. It is, it is hot air. So I think those are the pieces that we actually have to put together. I'm hoping that the new task force will change that. Um, but one of the things that I do want to think about, what you think about, is our increased training capabilities. We spent about 10 months improving that for training and video games. I'll just let that one lay there because it's a big issue for our police officers. Thank you. Ms. Gibson? Well, I was very happy that at last the council decided to act on the police oversight commission. Um, had been a long time coming and uh, it needed a long, long time ago. It was taken too long for action to be taken on that. And I call counsel for that, the majority on council. 
but now it looks like we do have a path forward. Um, and uh, I have talked with uh, police officers, and I've talked with um, several other people who would like to see real change in, in the police department. And they all agree with me that, um, that the best uh, choice for police for the POC would be for training. <coughs> Civilian training for the DOC members, and I would support that. I think the steps that have been taken so far with the Police Oversight Commission are, are at least in the right direction. Um, it, it needs to really be completely overhauled. Um, it didn't do anything, so it, it's been a pretty big failure just in general. Um, so, just the fact that we are analyzing it and restructuring it right now is a step forward, but I think. With the police in general, there's beyond just the uh, POC. There, there are many, many, many things that need to be worked on. Um, you know, building a relationship with the police department, um, community policing. And that might be a great place where the POC really starts to, to work is um, actually getting the, the police uh, involved in the community um, and and you know actually getting some some additional. Folks, if you have questions for the candidates, uh, I have a big long list of questions that may not relate to what you're interested about in or concerned about. Please fill out the cards, raise your hand. Folks will pick up those questions and we'll review them and ask them. So uh, please remember that. If you have a big burning concern or something that's really bothering you, now's your chance to address it to the candidates, all right? Uh, one of the last questions on the police. Uh, recently, it's been put out in the media that the uh, police force is not up to staff. There are a number of police officers retiring. Uh, what would you do to bring the police force back to full strength? Do you support bicycle police patrols on bike trails? And what are your thoughts about community policing? Uh, Ms. Gibson. trying to help are going to shoot you. And I'm not saying that's necessarily the case in Albuquerque at a given point, but there is a lot of tension. The police are, in a lot of cases, uh, scared of the public, and the public is, of course, scared of the police because of um, the tragedies that have happened recently. And I think approaching the problem as a relationship building um, issue is, is critical. Um, I think things like community policing would help with that. Um, getting the police uh, actively slightly more involved in the schools, um, getting them out to the neighborhood associations and getting up, it, 
getting their staffing back up to the appropriate levels. And you know, some of that's gonna take time. We've gotta get through this Department of Justice investigation and actually make a police officer an honorable, desirable profession again, and it just isn't <laughs>
where you live next to the Air Force Base. It affects all of us. Um, so, this is something I go to the meetings. I'm, I'm keeping up with this. Um, when I'm elected your city councilor, I will stand firmly behind NMED, the Mexico, New Mexico Environmental Division's demands that were put on the Air Force this past week. Number one, pumping one and a half million gallons of, of contaminated water. Number two, uh, remove the soil at the leak site. And number three, clean up the ethylene dibromide. It makes no sense for us to um, talk about conservation of water if the water we're conserving is contaminated. This is something we have to deal with. We cannot put it off. Thank you. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here and I'm going to give you a minute and a half for the question. There's a national movement in place to make our cities more walkable and to help revitalize our urban centers. What are your views on the movement? How would you make District 7 more walkable? And along that, should the city expand public transportation? And should we subsidize that public transportation to an even greater degree? Ms. Arnold Jones. <coughs> the question of walkability is an interesting question, and I'm looking at the color of the hair in this room. And I say that <laughs> because some of the move to walkability means limiting your access. And that is troubling to me. Part of being walkable shouldn't just be that things are only accessible by walking. Being accessible by walking with lots of benches, that's a good idea. I like the concept of walkability where there are fewer curves and, and, and fewer hard angles so that people who are mobily challenged, whether you are a mom with a baby carriage or someone in a wheelchair, that you are able to easily get around. You know, my folks are 87 years old, and they look at the curb cuts for mobility as face planters, because it's so easy to trip because they can't see it. So are there some other good things? You know, we've had form-based code in our city, um, I guess for six years now, and there is not a single permit request to date. But there are lots of good ideas that are coming about out of walkability. Do I think it's nice to be able to um, easily get from uh, Louisiana, from um, uptown to the other side of the street? You bet I do. I'm the one that keeps saying, gosh, maybe we need a tunnel with a park across it. But we have to be mindful of making sure that it's accessible to everybody. Ms. Gibson. Oh, I love this question. <laughs> <laughs> it is too big for one minute, but that's okay. I'll do my best. Oh, minute and a half. Oh, that makes all the <laughs> um, I, I love the idea of urban infill and then a planned approach where we can have pocket neighborhoods that mix commercial um, efforts as well as um, residential. Um, and you know, I've got a lot of gray hair too, and walking is good for me. I can do it, and we can put in park benches to get from one place to another. Um, but that would be such a, uh, an improvement for District 7 for us to find, to target certain areas, um, make them more aesthetically pleasing, make them more uh, friendly to shopping, um, and, you know, little restaurants, coffee. Uh, shops, places like that. Um, you know, the, um, the form based code is something that um, Councilor Arnold Jones just mentioned. Um, they've used that um, over at uh, Q. And, oh, I think I'm sorry. Anyway, so we can use that same thing. Park once, and then you can walk a neighborhood, you know, walk a commercial area. And I just think um, it makes me very excited. I'm a huge proponent of uh, smart growth infill, um, using our neighborhoods 
extensively. Um, I think before we even talk about that, we need to talk about limiting urban sprawl again. Um, and I know I probably just sound extremely redundant on this, but a lot of Owl Creek's problems just come back to the fact that we're just physically too big. Can we make a more efficient uh, transportation system if we keep growing? It, it, it's just not possible to keep putting in more bus lines if the city just keeps getting wider and wider and wider. A, a denser, more um, sensibly planned out community where you could walk, where you have markets close to you in certain centers, in, in little shopping areas that are near residences, that's what we need to be focusing on. And we need to look at the areas. District 7 is, is surrounded. It, it's not one that is affected by, by what well, is affected by urban sprawl, but it's not contributing to urban sprawl. We need to look at District 7 and figure out where else can we put little markets? I know I have to drive at least 15 minutes to get groceries. Um, and you know, it's just, it's, it's not an effective setup for, for our cities. Um, you know, we, we should have markets and businesses close to where we're living and the way we just keep expanding out and out and out is not gonna work for, uh, you know, funding transportation. It's just gonna be hugely wasteful. <laughs> Kids can, in a lot of uh, cases, they can be extremely beneficial. They can help start up large businesses, small businesses, um, get jobs into an area, and you know, uh, help investors pay for things like parking garages. So, in some senses, yes, they're they're positive. Again, I, I'm very uh, kind of on the same uh, same in the same boat as uh, as Ms. Gibson. I think it's one of those things that has pros and it has cons. And it's something that should be evaluated further, especially we need to look at what's going into the Windrock area in the first place. We're also talking about putting apartments right behind there. Um, it's, it's one of those things that needs to be weighted uh, and with community feedback uh, and, and talked about a little bit more, I think. As we talk about this, let's remember that Windrock is private property, private enterprise. I just happen to be at the TID meeting today. That's tax increment development district. And that money that is set aside is for infrastructure. And I do not see that a parking garage is part of that. Now, do I think there should be a parking garage? You bet, because I am an advocate of park one. We can do many things. But unless you have the parking that is structured, we are not going to have that. And as I see Windrock and Uptown and Coronado growing, we are going to need that capacity, but it's not just Winrock. It's Jerry Klein Park. I am so excited that there are 14 national and international tennis tournaments coming up, but there's not enough parking, and it is very detrimental to the neighborhood. And I believe that we can impose upon uh, the Goldman Group to make sure that there is a shuttle system between that parking garage going over the pedestrian bridge to service Jerry Klein Park. Very good reasons to build a parking garage.
to the school of increased traffic in Pennsylvania and Indian School. Would you propose zoning restrictions on what types of development can be allowed near elementary schools? Well, that's the whole point of the city council is to evaluate each uh, area and, and zone it specifically to make sure our city remains beautiful and effective, um, to make sure our traffic flows correctly, make sure our kids are safe, and to just make sure the city grows appropriately. Um, with this apartment building specifically, I know a lot of neighborhoods are concerned about the height of it, um, how many units are going to be going in there, and what types of units, uh, what types of Examples of the mayor's AB2 plan were a whitewater rafting venue, a colossal sports venue, and uh, then the city council redirected funds towards Paseo del Norte and I-25. Now the latest project is the Rio Grande Vision, which is about development in and around Bosque. Many environmental groups, neighborhood associations, coalitions, and other community groups have stated strong opposition against the proposed plans. What are your views on the ABQ plan initiatives, and not just the specific one, but allowing the mayor to move forward with such plans? Uh, well, again, it is a vision. If you want to get something done, you've got to throw something out there, and people have to push back. I believe that's what the mayor did. But I know that he is looking at the growth of Tingley Beach and the Bio Park, and is there some way to actually provide more access Bosque and to the river without damaging the actual Bosque. I think it is worth thinking about. Uh, the, the section is rather small. Um, I, I, have, I have listened to him talk about the kayaking. I'm not quite there yet because, you know, I used to ride my horse across the river and, and I'm, just, I'm just struggling with how much water is there. Um, but, but I do think that we need to look at our city in a holistic way. And when you look at the river, both sides of it, what, what is the part that will actually attract people? But again, making sure that we preserve it. It's also a really big deal to me. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Well, I have read the Rio Grande Vision, and um, I'll tell you the problem. 
problem that I have with it. It includes commercialization that I don't think is in the best interest for the Bosque or the city of Albuquerque. You know, I mentioned a little while ago, I've been knocking on doors and talking to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And I have not yet once talked with one person who is in favor of development of the Bosque. So, well, I, I, I want us to project Albuquerque as an appealing destination. And we can be touting the merits of the Bosque, but let's do it for the right reasons. Let's do it because it's wild, it's natural, it has its own unique charm. Um, the Rio Grande Vision calls for at least three pedestrian crossings over the river. Um, calls for food service off levee, but on the Bosque. Well, I think it's somewhat interesting the, the sort of take on this that uh, a lot of people have um, that we don't want to damage the Bosque by putting in um, um, businesses and stuff like that. I'm getting a second bachelor's in uh, biology at UNM right now, I'm taking classes on the Bosque, and it's funny to hear people say that we don't want to damage the Bosque because the Bosque is extremely damaged right now, and I think the idea of developing the Bosque is sort of missing the point. First, we need to go back and, and do extreme restoration of the Bosque. Um, we do have this amazing ecosystem that runs through the middle of our city, and it would have a huge draw for tourism, um, especially ecotourism. Uh, we don't need, you know, we don't need bridges over, we don't need uh, shops there. What we need is to have this amazing ecosystem that people can come enjoy in its natural uh, state, which it's not in. Ms. Gibson, some neighborhoods, uh, old question, should neighborhoods be notified when group homes seek to move into their neighborhoods? Is it important for information about the nature of these group homes to be included in neighborhood notification? then yes, my answer would be yes. But just to have a group home, you know, a group home can be a lot of things. That could be assisted living home. That could be a, a group home for people who are, have some disabilities. Um, so my answer is no, except when it's yes. <laughs>
which means that there's 1,200 feet separation. Minimum, there are rules. And because of a hole between state statute and city statute, which is in conflict about what is a group, we have this problem. And so I'm going to call on Daniel Ivy Soto. We have got to fix this. This is the District 7 Coalition of Neighborhood Associations. Are you a member of a neighborhood association? If so, which one and for how long? And what changes would you recommend to try to improve or implement more responsiveness to the individual neighborhood associations for positive action from the city and so forth? And at one time, the city of Albuquerque had an office of neighborhood coordination that was very vital and that is was an independent office and it's now been relegated to the basement of City Hall and it's under the planning department. So people in neighborhood associations are concerned. So are you a member of a neighborhood association? And if so, which one for how long and what changes would you do to make the neighborhood associations uh, more responsive, uh, to make them more viable and so forth? Mr. Biggs. I'm, uh, I'm in the McKinley Neighborhood Association area. Um, I was in and out of the country for most of the beginning of the years that I was living in uh, Albuquerque, um, in Iraq, and, and in and out through service-related things. When I came back, I opened my business, and I, I work basically every night. So I actually am not a member of my own neighborhood association. Getting um, the neighborhood associations to work a little more closely with the city, I think in a lot of cases that just uh, ends up being the the elected officials need to be going to these meetings and meeting with the people. Um, if, if we're there listening to your concerns, then we'll take them to the city council. And I think us showing up is, is probably the first step in, in getting, uh, uh, getting us to work together closely. Ms. Arnold Jones. Well, I was a founding member of Sandia High School Area Neighborhood Association that started in 1995. And I'm still a member. Uh, I was lucky enough to be the secretary for the District 7 Coalition for a lot longer than you probably care to know about. Um, and, and I loved every second of it. And those of us who are neighborhood association folks know that you are ignored until something really awful happens or really good happens. And I am grateful for your service in that time. Do I think notification could be better? I'm guessing that most of the notice is pretty good. Uh, I was at the TIF meeting today for Winrock, and uh, you will all be getting notices from here on out whenever we have that tax increment development district meeting, because it's important. That's where we're going to start talking about traffic issues and start driving those traffic studies. And is there one thing that could be done? As your city councilor, we need to coordinate because it turns out that I cannot make 16 meetings at the same night. <laughs> terribly long, I'm sorry to say, but I have been going to the Coalition 7 meetings uh, for some time, and uh, a friend of mine said something to me a while ago that's always stuck in my head. She said, all I ever really needed to know about politics I learned in my neighborhood association. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, they're very useful. I, I agree with uh, Councilor Arnold Jones that uh, the best motivator, the best organizing tool you can have is an independent threat. I've seen that in my own neighborhood association. Um, but uh, when I'm on city council, I would very much like to reinvigorate the, um, uh, the office coordination. I got that wrong. Office of the Neighborhood of Coordination. Association meetings. You know what I mean. <laughs> and 